Martin. Uh, I'm from Continuum, former Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, which, uh, we merged with a former Honeywell Quantum Solutions about one year ago, and we form this kind of a combined entity now, in which we work both on software and hardware. And yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about chemistry. Um, okay, so basically our interest uh, as chemists is to try to simulate uh, complex uh, systems and complex molecules, complex materials, and try to predict their properties in order to obtain uh, benefits uh, in terms of obtaining uh, better uh, drugs, uh, better construction materials, better uh, technological uh, systems, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we want to do it on quantum computers. So this kind of uh, approach requires uh, developments both in algorithms and in the uh, hardware. So uh, an ideal workflow would be that we would define some uh, complex molecule that is uh, difficult to uh, do uh, on a normal computer, we would run it through a quantum computer, like uh, this I up here, and then we would get, uh, for example, ground state energy and also properties like spectroscopy, reactivity, response, or more on the um, flavor of this workshop uh, dynamics um, um, and other properties. Uh, however, as you well know, uh, there is always this problem with uh, molecular simulations, which is uh, twofold. On one hand, we have a uh, Hamiltonian, which is uh, very complicated, uh, which has of the order of n to the four terms. So this means that uh, each one of these terms uh, has to be measured and in the quantum computer and many times. And this puts a big penalty in the amount of uh, in the accuracy that you can obtain from these kind of simulations. And also, uh, when you try to do state preparation, uh, usually the circuits are quite complicated. Uh, you get a circuit with uh, many different uh, two-qubit gates, uh, which uh, produces a large circuit depth. And as uh, circuit depth uh, is related to noise, uh, it produces lots of noise. And as we are still uh, in this era in which uh, fault tolerance is still not a commonplace, uh, this means that uh, our simulations suffer. So there has been, and there is a lot of ongoing work in uh, developing solutions uh, to these problems. So try to extract the most juice uh, from the qubits, uh, giving these uh, problems. And here are uh, some of the approaches that we, my team we, we are investigating. Uh, for example, uh, investigation in noise resilient algorithms, uh, as like the poster child of uh, this is BQ, as we have seen in previous talks. Uh, we also look into measurement reduction methods, uh, like these methods in which you try to identify terms of a commutation and the commute and they will measure them together. Embedding methods to uh, try to deal with uh, large molecules uh, using quantum embedding and only treating quantumly and the quantum computer uh, is a kind of a small uh, segment of it. And also noise mitigation um, in order to uh, reduce uh, the stock effect of noise on the output obtained by the quantum computer. Um, one thing we are very keen in my team to do is uh, to uh, play with the hardware uh, because that uh, gives us a flavor about how noise uh, works and uh, how we can tackle it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show some of these experiments, but before I'm going to show uh, this commercial slide. <laughs> Um, all of these uh, approaches we have been investigating um, are being uh, developed and integrated into this uh, package that we call in quantum, uh, which basically works by uh, and defining some molecule or material of interest, defining the algorithms, uh, then uh, using quantum to uh, transform it into a quantum circuit, uh, run it uh, via our quantum compiler ticket, and obtain a optimized circuit, and then uh, run the simulation on a backend, which can be a hardware backend, like a superconducting or ion trap or some emulator. And then from there, transform the output into some result that is kind of uh, understandable for a chemist. 
Um, so yeah, this uh, package collects all the uh, scripts and all the um, algorithms we have been uh, researching in the last years. So let's go for a bit of uh, uh, some of the things we have been looking at. Uh, so I'm going to start by showing uh, some work we did on uh, periodic systems, uh, which was motivated uh, by our interest in uh, starting to look into the combination of symmetry and noise mitigation. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it in a, in a slide, but another piece of background for this uh, experiment. So we did this uh, work, uh, study of phases of iron, uh, in quantum computers uh, as a collaboration with uh, between us and Nippon Steel, uh, the corporation. Basically, we wanted to demonstrate periodic boundary conditions um, in quantum computers, and they wanted to uh, explore quantum computing in uh, iron alloys. So we came to the middle ground and we decided to look at uh, basically ferromagnetic iron in two different phases. And the idea of the project was to try to see whether we, uh, we would be able to improve the description of the relative stability between these two phases. Uh, if you do a high level, uh, very uh, elaborate uh, classical calculation, you can see that the difference in energy between these two phases of ferromagnetic iron is about the order of 15 kilojoules per mole. But if you do a Hartree Fock calculation with this, uh, you get uh, such a very big uh, difference with the uh, theoretical result. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say that this is a lattice constant versus the energy of uh, each phase. And this is the full CI uh, reference. Um, so yeah, uh, we wanted to see whether uh, using uh, quantum computing we could uh, improve this uh, description. And this uh, problem, as I said, uh, served as a playground to play with our uh, something we can we cooked uh, in house uh, in terms of noise mitigation, which is a method we call the partition measurement symmetry verification. Um, this is basically a post selection method in which uh, we uh, exploit the symmetries of the system to try to uh, combine with. Uh, identification of uh, terms that are commuting the Hamiltonian to try to uh, identify which uh, shots from our quantum simulations are wrong and which ones are right, and then keeping not just the right, right ones. So the idea is um, there are some symmetries that can be uh, described by strings of the Z, Pauli Z, uh, by stabilizers, basically, uh, in such sense that uh, if uh, there is a change in symmetry, there is a change and associated pay change in parity, and this can be uh, identified uh, in post-processing. Um, so typically one uses uh, symmetries like particle conservation symmetry or spin conservation symmetry, but this is also generalizable to uh, point group symmetry, which is uh, important in molecules. Uh, so if there is a... a inversion center, uh, rotation axis or some mirror plane that can, whose symmetry can be described with uh, some string of the set operators, then it can be used with this method. And then what we do is uh, these strings of uh, symmetries, uh, we combine them uh, with uh, our um, commuting uh, identification in the Hamiltonian. So we partition the Hamiltonian into commuting sets and then to each one of these commuting sets, we add a string of uh, these uh, Z Paulis, uh, because basically uh, symmetries commute with the Hamiltonian. And this is a negligible penalty in terms of uh, adding quantum resources because these are one qubit gates. So the extra noise you induce because of these extra terms is, uh, is manageable, basically. So yeah, you create these uh, partitions with these extra Z uh, strings. And then you measure, and then each time you measure, you check that uh, the symmetry and the parity you are obtaining uh, is compatible with these the symmetries. And if it is not compatible, uh, this means that uh, you have an, a result that is not valid, and you remove it from the statistics. And you keep doing it with all of them until you get some uh, kind of nice statistics. Okay, so we applied that on this uh, iron simulation. 
we did a very simple, very uh, simplified uh, model of iron, uh, just a two qubit uh, calculation uh, using um, qubit tapering from an initial four qubit simulation. We ran our uh, simulations on IBM Casablanca, uh, which has seven qubits, and um, we used this method, partition measurement symmetry verification in combination with the spam correction. And uh, we even uh, did a comparison of, between two classical optimizations for the QE, uh, Rotosolve, which is based on uh, exploiting the sinusoidal nature of uh, the rotation gates, and the stochastic gradient descent. And uh, here we go to the results. Uh, well, not to the results, we forgot a bit of more of explanation about the model. Um, in order to fit uh, these iron simulations on the IBM machine, we did uh, lots of simplifications. And the procedure was that uh, we started with a classical calculation uh, with a couple cluster on PySCF with a rich basis set and a rich uh, K-point mesh. And then uh, we analyzed uh, the uh, amplitudes of the couple cluster of solution and uh, made a mapping between the regular CC and the UCC uh, ansatz. So in this case, we identified that one of these excitations was much, much, much uh, higher in, in amplitude than the others. And so we simplified our ansatz for VQE with just one excitation, this one, which corresponds to a uh, jump uh, between uh, two electrons in gamma point into an orbital uh, or two orbitals, sorry, uh, in X point. And then, so our answer was uh, only had this time. And then we ran our experiments on the IBM machine. Uh, and these are results for uh, stochastic gradient descent, and these are results for Rotosolve. This is the number of steps, and this is the variation in energy. And uh, as you can see in both cases, uh, the raw result is relatively far away from uh, the theoretical result. The theoretical result is this dotted line. And this is the raw result. Red is spam and black is spam plus P plus B in both cases. And yeah, what you can see is that uh, when we apply both uh, noise mitigation methods, uh, the results become very, very, very close uh, to the theoretical result, which is a symptom of uh, how important it is to add noise mitigation to our experiments. It was also interesting to see that uh, Rotosolve was able to converge uh, the system in just uh, three steps, while uh, stochastic gradient descent took uh, quite a long time to converge. Uh, that's the result, so surprised me a little bit. But yeah, uh, indeed, uh, noise mitigation helps and it helps a lot. Then uh, I'm going to explain another uh, example in which we use noise mitigation. Uh, which is a collaboration we did with uh, Roche um, in the problem about uh, ranking drugs. In this case, the problem is the following. Um, so we have a set of uh, compounds and uh, that we want to use um, for some uh, pharmaceutical application. In this particular case, it's uh, about uh, checking the binding between the drug and the protein active center. And you have a collection of uh, polymorphs of this, uh, of this drug, and uh, you want to screen them. And experimentally, this is very expensive because you have to take each one of these, and then you have to uh, run the experiments and uh, collect the results, and yeah, it's a lot of money and time. Instead, you, what you aim is to do it uh, computationally by uh, simulating the docking uh, between, uh, or binding between uh, the drug and the protein active center, and then computationally uh, uh, kind of uh, keep only a small subset, then then you can use uh, in experiments, in real lab experiments to continue the screening. Um, and this is the particular example we looked at. Um, this uh, oxazine molecule here, which is an inhibitor for uh, this base one uh, protein. Uh, we chose this one because there's a lot of data uh, in databases uh, for this thing. And what we did was to take this molecule and try different uh, variants of this uh, head group in here. 
And the idea was to try to uh, replicate on the quantum computer the ranking that we obtained classically for the different activity of uh, these wires, uh, each one of these uh, variants of this uh, inhibitor. Um, well, so we created a model. Uh, we created a QMM model uh, with a protein and the water uh, surrounding. And we created this quantum region here with uh, this oxazine. And uh, we had to do some uh, simplifications uh, because the problem is still very complex. Uh, and then we calculated the binding energy as the energy of the ligand in protein minus the energy of the ligand in uh, cosmos solvent. Um, this is still uh, quite a big uh, system to deal with in a quantum computer. So this also was a good. Uh, system to try quantum embedding. And that's what we did. Uh, we took a density matrix embedding theory and applied it to this uh, oxazine. We partitioned the oxazine in the three fragments. And uh, each fragment would be processed uh, separately uh, with this uh, theory. Um, very quickly, what is density matrix embedding theory? So basically, uh, the idea is to do a Schmidt decomposition of these of the orbitals and, and the localization of the orbitals uh, so that uh, you get a quantum region and a quantum path region. And then you only need to use the quantum computer on the quantum region. And in this particular case, it was interesting to see that uh, there, are, there were two regions that could be, you didn't gain much from using the quantum computer. So we treated them at a uh, hard clock level and then we treated this uh, Chuck here uh, with a quantum computer. And this is what we obtain. Uh, so we use a small basis set, uh, four qubit models, and PSC for the integrals. And we compared uh, with uh, these results from couple cluster theory. So, in theory, you get uh, something like this in terms of the ordering. Each one of these points is a variant of uh, the oxacin. And you see more or less uh, some trend. Um, this is state vector results uh, with uh, this uh, small model to replicate uh, nicely, qualitatively, uh, the results we obtained for its couple cluster. And on two experiments. Uh, we run uh, experiments on uh, quantum hardware, and we apply it in this case just PMSB. And you can see the difference here in terms of uh, errors. Uh, this is error versus uh, each one of these uh, variants of the oxazine. Um, so um, the orange is ligand in solution, uh, blue is uh, ligand in protein. And uh, you can see if you compare this with this, that uh, error mitigation uh, lowers uh, the error in one order of magnitude. So again, very important to use error mitigation uh, when you uh, deal with hardware. And this is how uh, it uh, looks uh, in hardware. We tried it both in Casablanca and in our ion trap machine. Um, and indeed, uh, we could see that more or less the, uh, the trend uh, is reproduced with the quantum computer. So this gives us uh, confidence that, uh, at least for this kind of uh, qualitative uh, analysis, the quantum computer uh, can be good in the future. But again, uh, if we apply error mitigation. And then I'm going to talk about a third example in which we uh, did a bit of uh, this kind of studies, which was the, uh, the collaboration with uh, Honeywell. Uh, to look at uh, atmospheric chemistry reactions uh, and also to as, uh, in the framework of uh, refrigerants. So in this particular case, uh, the reaction we wanted to look at is this reaction between methane and the OH radical uh, to obtain this uh, transition state and then have this uh, transformation uh, in which uh, OH uh, take on hydrogen and we are left with a CH3 radical. Uh, here are the species that uh, we considered uh, in this study. And in this study, we also um, 
took the opportunity to explore a bit uh, circuit depth reduction. And for that, we, came, we kind of uh, crafted this uh, protocol for uh, designing ANSAT set, uh, which is, uh, uses uh, initially the couple cluster ANSATs, the unitary couple cluster ANSATs, and do this series of steps. On one hand, we analyze the ANSATs to remove all uh, excitations that are forbidden by symmetry uh, using the Karkis theorem. Then we reorder the excitations, and then uh, we uh, do a process uh, called hardcore boson uh, transformation, in which the orbitals that are occupied by two electrons and uh, have the electron jumping into just one orbital, so two electrons jumping from one orbital to another orbital, are considered as some sort of effective uh, bosons. And um, then we do the excitations uh, in this way, uh, so that uh, we can reduce uh, greatly the number of uh, synods in, in the circuit. And then after this bosonization and then this uh, com composition of the circuit, we transform back into uh, fermions. So now uh, all the spin orbitals are rep represented, each one of them by a, a qubit. And then uh, we identify which uh, excitations uh, commute in the circuit, and then we group them together uh, to also save uh, extra C nodes in the system. And with this, uh, we get a very uh, compact uh, UCC ANSAT. And then we apply to each one of the molecules in this uh, system. So in this graph here, let's look at the CH4. We have a naive UCC uh, with a C not count with respect to the number of qubits. You can see that it grows uh, quite a lot, uh, the number of qubits. Then this is uh, just using the commuting sets. Uh, you get a lot of uh, savings. And then when you do the hardcore boson and uh, the symmetry, then you get uh, this uh, extra. So this is, uh, works very well. And then here you can see it in the other molecules, in CH3, uh, in the water, which radical in the transition state. And um, one thing you can notice is that uh, this protocol for uh, optimizing the circuit depth is heavily dependent on the symmetry of the molecule. You can see, uh, for example, in this graph here, uh, uh, we are showing the improvement of the uh, error in the simulations with, uh, with respect to each molecule. And you can see that on uh, molecules that are very symmetric, there is a large improvement. But this poor transition state here, the improvement is not so good, basically because uh, we have treated with a C1 symmetry, so no symmetry. Okay, um, so this was with respect to uh, energies of the ground state, but we also wanted to look at uh, excited states. Um, we took the methane molecule and we calculated the, kind of the low-lying excited state spectrum. And for that, we used the quantum space expansion algorithm. Um, for those of you who are not very familiar with it, the idea is um, you uh, create a Hamiltonian matrix, um, and you diagonalize it basically to obtain the excited states. But the basis set in which you express this Hamiltonian is made of non orthogonal correlated wave functions. And these non orthogonal correlated wave functions are constructed by uh, doing uh, linear excitations on your BQE solution. So you take all of the single uh, particle excitations, and with uh, this basis set that you create, uh, you can construct your Hamiltonian matrix elements and you measure them in the quantum computer. Also, as the basis set is non-orthogonal, uh, you also have to measure the, uh, the overlap matrix. You do that as well in the quantum computer. And once you have all your elements uh, measured in the quantum computer, uh, you pass them to the uh, classical computer and you classically diagonalize uh, this eigenvalue problem. And with that, you obtain uh, the different excited state energy uh, span and this uh, subspace. Okay, so yeah, we ran some experiments on, uh, on the H1 device, and the results are here in this table. These are the excited states, the ground state and the excited states. Uh, this is the raw result, sorry, uh, this is state vector simulations. 
This is the raw result from the quantum computer. And this is the results with a PMSB. And as a sanity check, uh, here are results from uh, equation of motion couple cluster, just to check that the CPU results is uh, fine. And what you can see is that the, the ion trap machine uh, does a, not a bad job of uh, doing these uh, simulations, but with PMSB, you get uh, much better results. And in some cases, uh, you are able to kind of stabilize the second decimal uh, in, in comparison with the CPU. Uh, okay. Uh, demanding chemist, uh, when looking at this table, was going to say, okay, uh, this is still uh, one order of magnitude above chemical accuracy, and I'm going to say yes. Sorry about that. Uh, we didn't manage to get into chemical accuracy yet, uh, which means that uh, more work is required to, in terms of uh, noise mitigation or an algorithmic you know, to, to get there. But it's still, uh, this is promising. It shows a good path towards uh, getting, getting nice results. Um, in terms of, uh, well, I should sure include this slide to show, kind of demonstrate a bit uh, how PMSB works. Uh, this is the result for the transition state with uh, no PMSB. Um, da, 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 da. And this is the theoretical result. And uh, yeah, with, uh, with no PMSB, the result basically is almost the same as uh, Hartley Fock. When you include PMSB, you see a big, big uh, improvement in the solution. Still not exactly totally in, in there, but a big improvement indeed. Uh, so we are kind of uh, very happy about this method. And now this is, well, uh, just a couple of slides about work in progress. We want to, we want to improve uh, the resource even more. Uh, so we are trying to apply DMET, the embedding method on, on all of these molecules. And uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, but uh, this is also nice to illustrate how improvements in hardware are also uh, helpful uh, for this kind of simulations. Uh, this slide is about the transition state uh, using PMSB and six qubits. Um, this uh, yellow point uh, was calculated with a uh, previous generation of the H1 device. Uh, we did this simulation. Term. Uh, November here or December, if I remember correctly, you see the difference is significant with respect to uh, the theoretical result here. Now we are comparing it with here, uh, although it's different level of theory, it should be comparable. And you can see that the difference is much smaller. So we have gained a significant amount in terms of fidelity for the H1 device. Okay, so this was kind of the experimental part of this talk. Um, how much do I have left? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, then I'll, I'm going to skip another thing that I want to do. Yeah, if you want to, you can chat with me. Already. I'm sorry, it's, you have 10 minutes. So you have ah, 10 minutes. Uh, well, okay, then I'm going to explain this very quickly. Okay, very quickly. Um, sorry, I was a bit slow, but uh, I wanted to show also some results uh, in terms of algorithms about uh, how to reduce circuit depth in the uh, UCC ansatz. Uh, the idea was to uh, take the expression for the UCC ansatz, uh, which is this one, uh, when you are dealing with quantum computing, because you are doing the traitorized version of the UCC ansatz, and uh, realize that. Uh, in this answer, there are lots of terms that are negligible because they are very small. Uh, so it would be good to be to get rid of these uh, excitations in the answer and uh, get a more compact answer. And uh, we have seen already uh, some uh, approaches to do that, like uh, this adaptive approaches with adapt and etc. Or do, there is also the possibility of doing uh, other encodings, like uh, the bosonization I showed before or use effective Hamiltonians to include some of these excitations in the Hamiltonian. Maybe the simplest one is doing excitation filtering, which was firstly proposed by people at Berkeley Labs, which is basically you use MP2 theory to uh, approximate uh, the amplitudes in the ansatz, and then use uh, define some threshold. And uh, so basically you identify which amplitudes are below this threshold, uh, with this uh, kind of approach, and then you remove them from the ansatz. 
And what we did in our case, in collaboration with uh, the folks at uh, Cambridge University, was to um, do this, but with Monte Carlo methods. So we came, we started with, from, from a projected uh, Schrodinger equation and doing a bit of maths, 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 maths. Uh, we come up with this recursive formula for the amplitudes, uh, which can be sampled uh, with Monte Carlo methods uh, using uh, rules for spawning from the hard effect determinant into other determinants for death and from annihilation of determinants of a different sign uh, given by the walkers. And uh, the idea was to use this approach to uh, uh, run this Monte Carlo approach uh, with a few shots uh, on the ansatz. Uh, then I uh, identify the excitations that matter and don't matter in the ansatz and remove the ones that don't matter, check that the energy doesn't do anything funny, and then construct the quantum circuit and then run on the uh, quantum computer. And uh, very quickly, results. You can see that, for example, if you compare the percentage of energy recovered versus the amplitude threshold, uh, at similar threshold, this uh, MCC obtains much better results. Uh, for example, for this CS2 triplet uh, uh, molecule in equilibrium, bend or stretch, you get more nice results. And then if you look in terms of circuit depth, uh, you can see that uh, this blue line is a MEPI2, this line is uh, MCC, MCUCC, the Monte Carlo approach. You can see that Monte Carlo approach performs very well in all geometries. And there is an even more spectacular case, which is the dihedral angle in this uh, diazine. Uh, so we, I'm showing here energies for the triplet, which is this curve, and the singlet, which is this curve, and this is the uh, errors. Uh, for uh, MP2, which is this green line for these green dots for the triplet and the blue dots for the singlet, and uh, the Monte Carlo approach, which is these crosses. And uh, you can see that in this particular case, when we set the threshold to 0 0.01, uh, the MP2 screening uh, doesn't reproduce this uh, crossing that we should have at this angle when we are changing the dihedral angle, while uh, MCC manages to reproduce it uh, nicely. And this crossing is not partially fixed by MP2 until you go to much lower thresholds. Uh, but in, he, in this case, uh, MC uses it. Uh, still reproduce it well. Um, to finalize, we also did uh, some estimate uh, with bigger basis sets. Um, and uh, in particular, for example, if uh, one uh, set the threshold to 10 to minus 4, uh, you could reduce almost half of the amplitudes in this uh, triple uh, zeta basis set. Uh, uh, while obtaining very good uh, energies related to the full, uh, the full access. Uh, so this looks promising if we manage to run BQEs with uh, 15,000 parameters, which is a big if. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to finish here. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Um, just thanking all of these guys, people in my team and our collaborators, and all collaborators from the University of Extremadura. And I'll, uh, uh, I'm open for questions. Thanks for listening. Do we have questions for the speaker? I'm uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have one question, but I think an approximation to go from the uh, spin orbitals to star orbitals mapping. So is it a kind of a geminal seniority zero approximation? Um, is it related to geminals? And you can think of it as a seniority zero approximation. Uh, each qubit in this representation represents one special orbital. Okay. And then you do the excitation of these special orbitals, and then you transform back into spin orbitals. And with this trick, you reduce the number of signals. Okay, so uh, you can only access to the seniority zero energy, I guess. So uh, not really, because we also, when we transform uh, back into spin orbitals, we have also the excitations uh, from the other contributions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the for the.
to the large ecosystem and you um, configuration Um, in the fragment, we use an active space. True, but in the fragments, I see that you have hydrogen and so 3D, you have like a lot of orbitals. Yeah, but the thing is that. Uh, we do the quantum embedding to uh, only consider that fragment. And then in the, inside that fragment, yes. we do only an active space of a homonymous. Ah, OK. OK. Yeah, I guess it, it wasn't very clear from the slides. Sorry about that. Oh, no, I, and I get it. Thanks. So could you, so, so did I understand correctly that in the uh, Monte Carlo UCC method, you use um, Monte Carlo as an initial step to filter yes, all the, the operators you put exactly. in the cluster. We use operator. it as a classical pre-processing step. Okay. Do several shots. And so do you think it would make sense to use it in conjunction with adapt VQE type of methods just to, to construct the initial pool of operators and then you use adapt VQE to, to have a shorter and that? In theory, it might work, but I'm not sure. Uh, the problem is the ordering. When you are running this uh, Monte Carlo approach, you have to choose an ordering for the excitations uh, because you are considering the whole axis. Um, if you find the excitations that uh, are above some threshold and then use them as a pool for adapt, I don't know if the process of uh, doing the adapt selection and changing the order uh, will uh, have an effect on which uh, amplitudes are uh, important or not important. It's an interesting uh, question, uh, maybe worth exploring. I have a follow-up question. Um, um, in, so it's also about your opinion, your personal opinion on whether variational methods will be enough to reach some kind of advantage with respect to the best classical methods on these know. devices. OK, um, so I see I have to say something. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, for chemistry problems, for uh, reaching chemical accuracy, variational methods are not going to be useful uh, for real molecules, for kind of real problems. However, if you consider problems in which chemical accuracy is not required, I think variational methods have a good opportunity of being useful. Uh, like for example, uh, I usually think about this uh, problem of, um, you have some molecules, some complex molecules, and you have a spectrum of uh, excited states, and you want to classify them. You want to see, for example, if this singlet is below or above this triplet. And you run time-dependent EFT, and you are not sure of what you are getting, and you try to run couple cluster or any other method, and it's too expensive. And you don't care about whether your singlet is uh, 5 EB above, or 5 EB, or 3 EB, or 2 EB, or 1 EB. You just only want to know that the singlet is above the triplet or below the triplet. I think for this kind of qualitative uh, problems, uh, variational algorithms maybe uh, they have a chance to work. Say that uh, variational, uh, maybe it's a naive question, but why do we say that variational algorithms would not reach chemical accuracy? Is this related to the optimization or to the yes. expressi expressivity? Well, it's a of combination the... of things, uh, but uh, mainly uh, when you are dealing with real production work molecules, uh, you see that your ANSAT uh, requires a uh, huge amount of uh, parameters. So you need to optimize a very, very, very complex uh, potential energy surface. And I'm not sure that, well, I guess you should use uh, machine learning methods to optimize uh, your uh, 
your cost function. And I'm not sure that you can reach a chemical accuracy with uh, such a complex uh, sort okay, of, uh, a, energy source. It's related to the optimization then? Uh, yeah, well, on top of that, uh, it might require too many cycles. Uh, so yeah, I'm, my, my main doubts are related to the optimization step. Okay. Um, I had another question, but uh, okay. Uh, no, I, I would like to better understand the post selection approach. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, for the error mitigation, you apply the, the symmetry, uh, some symmetry operator that enforce the symmetry on, on your states. So, that's, that's does that increase the, the, the depth of your uh, of your circuit by a very small percentage? How does it uh, work? Yes, basically, uh, for each symmetry that you're considering, you add one extra layer of uh, Z operators. Okay, so it's uh, it's limited. Mm -hmm. And the, the post selection, it seems that you are measuring the states. Is, is yes, that we true? measure the states, and as the symmetry operators commute uh, with this uh, partition, uh, that uh, output also uh, has a parity. And if the parity is right, then we keep it. If it has the wrong parity, we discard it. Uh, it's more of a comment on your question. So uh, are in tiny, tiny data sets. So if you define chemical accuracy as close to full CI, yeah, but then if you consider chemical accuracy close to nature, you're way off. Like, and you're gonna need lots more qubits. Yeah. Even for simple systems like H2 and SCO3G, it's not good. You need, yeah, CCPVTZ, which is, yeah. don't, no. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have more questions. And just follow up with one. <laughs> uh, I know that DMACT, like I never used these uh, embedding methods, but DMACT is used also to, to simulate solids. I think that was a little bit the purpose of Garnet Chan because he wanted to simulate uh, high temperature super, uh, superconductors. Yes. So are you trying to go in that direction also for the solid state simulations? Do you yes, um, we are very interested in solid state. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, we are going to keep looking into embedding for solids as well. All right. Uh, one question again uh, about embedding as well, and uh, the fact that variational quantum eigen solver may not be uh, enough in the fu future. Uh, can you imagine doing a quantum phase estimation type of algorithm to do uh, embedding theories? Because normally with embedding theories, you have kind of self-consistent fields where you require uh, the density matrix, uh, the one particle density matrix, for instance, of the fragment. And I don't know with quantum phase estimation if you can get access to that and do the self-consistency. Have you mm. thought about that? No, I haven't thought about that. Uh, yeah, it's an intriguing question. Um, I guess it depends on the flavor of phase estimation. If you do canonical phase estimation, in theory, at the end, you get the exact uh, wave function. Uh, so, but yeah, yeah, then you would have to reconstruct it uh, every time. I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, that seems not, not that easy, yeah. Mm. Okay, we can think about that. Yeah. All right, uh, I maybe have a, uh, also another question. So this is uh, related to the question that came up before for the molecule. So uh, the iron, what was the, the, the very first example you showed? What was the, uh, the model that you used uh, for this? Um, it was just two spins or? Yeah, the, our uh, unit cell had uh, two iron atoms. Okay. Um, Two iron? Yes, two iron atoms. Well, it actually, uh, it was actually a one iron atom because one of them was in the corner and was uh, was in a. So, Adam then together was just one iron atom. 
molecules. Okay. And that's why we chose uh, ferromagnetic. If we had gone for the anti-ferromagnetic phase, uh, the simulation cell would have been much bigger mm -hmm. and a bit uh, out of reach for what we want. Okay, and a and, uh, question to the last uh, part that you were talking about. Um, this methods that you discussed in filtering the amplitudes, I guess this is something not restricted to, to quantum computing, right? So this could be uh, also used to do the filtering on. Yes, 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 indeed. Uh, could be used for a classical couple cluster as well. Methods of the use of such. Okay. Um, any more questions from the audience, maybe on Zoom? Doesn't seem to be the case. So thanks a lot uh, for your last presentation. Thank you. Okay, I guess there's a short coffee break. And we meet back.